How's it going so far? Good. Awesome. It's going good. I'm Scott Jackson. I'm from the University of Massachusetts, where I'm an extension professor in the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, I am a wildlife biologist and a wetland scientist, and have been working in this area, sort of collaborating with DEP for about 30 years or more. I have uh, I've served on my conservation commission in Waitley, Massachusetts now for 28 years. Uh, I've been chair for 18. And uh, Waitley is a town of 1,500 people. My annual budget up until this year was $500 a year. So um, I do have some sympathy for you that work on commissions or that are staff for commissions because there's a lot of detail in the regulations. There's a lot of different um, fields that you need to be familiar with, like plant identification and wildlife habitat evaluations and, and you know, hydrology calculations and stormwater management techniques and all of that stuff. So we're going to try today, using this workshop, to give you a feel for, for the delineation of bordering vegetated wetlands and also refer to some of the changes that have occurred in the years between 1995 when we created the first edition of this handbook and, and the most recent edition. Um, we're generally taking the approach that we're going to talk about how you do delineation, even though many of you may not do delineation yourself, but you may be reviewing delineations that are done by others. And so when I start saying, and then you have to, and then you do this, it's the royal you. It's like everybody it would be, this is what applicants are expected to do so that you know when they come in whether they've done a good job about it or not. So let me get started. So we're going to start with the regulations uh, because that's really what the, the handbook is meant to do is to try to take what the science and the regulations and put together a guidance document that will help you understand how to approach the delineation of BBWs or the review of BBW delineations. So in uh, 1055-2, we have basic information about the definition and the, how you delineate bordering vegetated wetlands. So bordering vegetated wetlands are freshwater wetlands that border on streams, creeks, lakes, ponds. And so the bordering is a really important component of this. Um, so essentially isolated wetlands that don't border on those things are not considered bordering vegetated wetlands, although if they fall into other resource areas like riverfront area or floodplains, land subject to flooding, they can still be protected. Now the boundary of a bordering vegetated wetland is the area within which 50% uh, or more of the plant community is made up of wetland indicator plants. And the area is saturated or inundated. Uh, so saturated or inundated conditions exist. And this was the basis for the two-parameter approach that was written into the 1995 manual. So the two parameters were vegetation and hydrology. Uh, and this contrasts with the federal method, which is a three-parameter approach, where you have to have uh, veg wetland vegetation, wetland soils, or hydric soils, and you have to have some other indicator of hydrology as well. And so what we call our two plus parameter approach, I'll describe a little bit later, but it really says that you need two main indicators and then you can add additional information in order to make sure that the line is accurate. There is a section in the regulations that allows for the delineation based on plants alone. And in general, we discourage that because we feel like you should use all available information and that often plants are a coarse way to identify a wetland and not really sufficient for identifying the wetland boundary. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is uh, as, as we get into the wetland plant section of the, of the uh, workshop. But here are the three different circumstances in which plants alone can be used. The first one is one that is okay to use. Basically, if all of the plants, all the dominant plants in the area are obviously wetlands, so they're categories in, that we're going to talk about in a minute of obligate and facultative wetland, uh, and the 
the boundary of the wetland is distinct and abrupt so that you're not dealing with a transition zone where you get a lot of wetland plants and then you start getting mixed with upland plants and then you get mostly uplands, but you just get obvious wetland, discrete border, obvious upland on the other side. Now these are, next are the two circumstances that I would suggest that you not, even though they're allowed by the regulations, that you actually use all the information that's available, but especially soils. One is when work is limited in the buffer zone. So currently, under the current regulations, <coughs> you can just use vegetation alone if you're only going to be in the buffer zone, or if the applicant's only going to be in the buffer zone. And sometimes when you're, you know, 80 feet away from your creek or the pond, it may seem overkill to make somebody go through a detailed evaluation of the weapon. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is, is that when you essentially approve a wetland delineation through a determination of applicability or through an order of conditions, that that is good for three years. And so that delineation is the official delineation for the next three years. And if the landowner comes back next year or two years from now with another project they want to do in the buffer zone, you're stuck with that delineation. So it's better to get it right the first time so that you're not stuck you know, with sort of a half-hearted effort uh, and uh, limited jurisdiction to try to correct that. The third circumstance under which plants alone can be used is when the issuing authority, like the Conservation Commission, decides it's okay. So essentially what the regulations do is give commissions the authority to just use plants if that's what they're comfortable with. It's important to remember that this part of the regulations was promulgated at the same time that the 1995 handbook was released. And it was at a time where people were most familiar with using plants to delineate PBWs. And so people weren't using soils. They were just basically looking at the plants and delineating that way for the most part. And so when it was decided to update the regulations and the guidance to try to bring it more in line with wetland science, we really were going to encourage people to use wetland soils and other indicators of hydrology in addition to plants. And those of indicators of hydrology, soils is one of the most reliable. So we knew we were going to have to encourage people, teach people how to use soils, but we knew there would likely be some pushback. The commissions that were not accustomed to that might not feel comfortable with it, and so this out was left for conservation commissions to say, I'm sorry, we're just not comfortable with that. We're going to just use plants. Well, it's been almost 30 years, and I think conservation commissions are now becoming much more familiar with how soils are used in delineation. And so in this latest edition of the handbook, we now sort of discourage using plants alone unless it, it's under section A there where you have a really obvious line. So um, if, if you're not going to go with plants alone, uh, then basically it's vegetation and hydrology because that's most consistent with the statute, the language in the statute. Uh, but hydrology is sort of a funny thing to say because vegetation is an indicator of hydrology. So is soils, and so are a bunch of other ones that I'm going to show you in a bit. And so in the handbook, we translate that to say you should be using vegetation and soils. Unless the soils are unreliable, then use other indicators of hydrology. And even when you use vegetation and soils, you should use all the other indicators of hydrology, every bit of evidence that's available from the site to try to accurately delineate the limits of wetland hydrology. And in some cases, like in disturbed sites, that means that sometimes you have to be creative about how you use the evidence that's available. So if the soils are unreliable because they've been altered, then you have to use vegetation and other indicators of hydrology. If the plant community is altered, then you might have to rely on soils and other indicators of hydrology. So Nancy went through sort of a summary of the changes that have occurred since the 1995 handbook and the, and the 2022 handbook that we're talking about today. I just want to emphasize the soils aspect because soils were really treated in a cursory way uh, in the 1995. So it's not to intimidate people 
And now it's time to update that information and provide much more scientifically credible and reliable information about soils and how they're used in delineation. And so Deb Henson, who's going to speak after the break, is going to talk, to give you a fairly detailed and extensive instruction on soils and hydric soils in particular. She is a soil scientist that teaches at UMass Amherst, and she's excellent. So there's a chapter in the handbook on soils. And then there are three appendices in, in the handbook on soils as well. So that's how much additional emphasis we're placing on soils. We talked about this two plus parameter approach. And so as I mentioned, the federal delineation approach has a three parameter approach. The old approach that's in the 95 manual is a two parameter approach. We call this a two plus because we believe that it should be flexible enough so that you can use all the available evidence to come up with the best line possible, which means the most accurate line. So there are one circumstance where we endorse the use of vegetation alone, which I've already talked about. And then where you have no evidence of disturbance and the soils are not difficult to analyze, and there's a whole section in the handbook about soils that are difficult to analyze, um, you can use vegetation and soils, which is what we recommend, or you could use vegetation and other indicators of hydrology. And so those are the two parameters. But the plus part is, is that, you know what, use whatever you've got and try uh, to get the best line possible. And then of course, with disturbed sites, you need that flexibility because sometimes the plants are unreliable, sometimes the soils are unreliable for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're just naturally difficult to interpret, sometimes they're disturbed. So when we talk, when the federal government talks about three parameter approach, they're talking about hydrology, vegetation, and soils. It's important to recognize that hydrology is in a category all its own, because it is hydrology that, that defines what a wetland is. Wetland is wet land. It is not a wetland without water, and the water is the hydrology part of this. And so in some ways, water is what should be used to define the boundary of a wetland. The problem is, is that sometimes water is hard to detect and often it's not there because it may only take a few weeks of water in the growing season in order to create a wetland and then the water table drops and that hydrology is no longer available to, to assess directly. So that's why it, in order to get to hydrology, we try to look at plants as an indicator of hydrology and soils as an indicator of hydrology. And then what the federal government calls hydrology indicators, we call other indicators of hydrology because plants and soils are also indicators of hydrology. So when you're in a wetland like this, you might say, well, we could easily use the water as an indicator that this is a wetland because the water is obvious. But in a wetland like this, there's very little, if any, standing water at any point in the year although this is a groundwater fed wetland and the water table is at or near the surface for much of the growing season. And so, you know, just looking for water is not a sufficient way to identify a wetland or to delineate it. And as I mentioned before, sometimes there's water there for part of the year and then later in the year there's no water at all. So you can't just constrain wetland delineation for the wettest time of the year when the water is there. You have to be able to do delineation in July and August. Of course, this July is not that hard. There's water <laughs> everywhere. But in most Julys and August, the water table's down, surface water's gone, and you have to look for other indicators. And so those other indicators, or the indicators of hydrology that we use, include plants. So this is marsh marigold, which is an obligate wetland species. That means that it almost never is anywhere other than in wetlands. So it's a very reliable indicator. And we use soils. And we use soils because when soils have been saturated or ponded long enough, they develop low oxygen conditions. And those conditions result in changes in the color of the soil that we can detect. And so Deb's going to talk quite a bit about how you interpret soil color in order to determine whether a site is wetland or upland. And then there are this category of other indicators of hydrology, like watermarks on trees or, or water-stained leaves. 
which sometimes can be very reliable and other times not terribly reliable. The problem is, is that they're not always present. Or if they're present, they're down near the water body, they're not up near the boundary. And so it's, it's something that you can use to confirm that a site does have wet conditions, but when it comes to the boundary, they're less, less useful than vegetation and soils. So I'm gonna start by talking about vegetation, how we use vegetation to determine whether a site is likely to be wetland or non wetland Now, wetland plants vary in their affinity for water. And so there are some plants, like this spatter dock, that is uh, an aquatic plant. Essentially, it only grows in water. And then you have up near the, the other thing I usually say about this is, is that if you're looking at this plant and wondering if you're near the boundary, you need a little more training, okay? <laughs> so that's the thing, it's, it's like this very reliable indicator of wetlands, so you're just never gonna find it near the boundary. And usually at the boundary, what you're seeing now is a mix of plants, some of which have an affinity towards wet conditions and others towards dry conditions, and they're all mixed together around the boundary. So you have to try to figure out, well, what's the plant community telling me? Is it, is it telling me this is wet or dry or almost wet? And in fact, a lot of the plants that grow near the boundary, even if they are more often found in wetlands than they are in uplands, if you put them in a pot and leave them in the backyard, they'll grow just like a tomato plant. They don't mind dry conditions. They occur more often in wet conditions because they can't compete with other vegetation in the dry conditions as well as they can under wet conditions. So they tolerate wetland conditions better than some of the other things that we consider indicators of dry conditions. And so that's what makes it so difficult to use plants to delineate a wetland is because you're looking at plants that aren't obligated to, li to live in wetlands most of the time. And you're getting a mix of upland and wetland plants. And so <clears throat> in order to try to figure out how to interpret the plants that are there on the site, there is a list of plants that can occur in wetlands that's compiled at a national scale and then broken up into regions. And so the national plant list, uh, this is the 2016 one, which is the last plant list that actually had a cover that you could use for a slide. But the one plant list that we're using in the handbook, or referring to in the handbook, was put out in 2020. The one, as Nancy mentioned, that's in the regulations, was put out in 1988. And so there's been a number of iterations since then where you know the, the federal agencies and regional botanists get together and begin updating it based on field experience and say, well, we gave it this category classification, but we think it probably should be this now. So the 2020 list is the best list to use for identifying wetland boundaries. And uh, it's quite a lengthy list. If you want to list virtually every plant that might occur in a wetland, that's a long list. I think there's something like 200 species of carex, which is a sedge, genus of sedge, on the plant list for Massachusetts. And so um, the way the plant list is arranged is you have a scientific name, and then on the far side on the right you have the common name, and then just next to the common name there in that, lap, that third column is the indicator status for the plant that's in that row. And at the top you see NCE, NCNE, that stands for North Central Northeast. So this is the plant list for the North Central Northeastern United States. Now, that, those categories that we talked about, those symbols refer to these five categories. And so we classify, the, with the National Plant List, plants are being classified into one of these five categories, obligate, means that it almost always occurs in wetlands. Upland means it almost never occurs in wetlands. It's almost always in uplands. And then there's the three facultative categories, where facultative wetland plants usually occur in wetlands, but they might be in uplands. The facultative upland usually occurs in uplands, but sometimes in wetlands. And the ones in the middle, the facultative, the fac species as we call them, they're real fence sitters. And those are the ones you see often right at the boundary. 
and so the ones that you find around the boundary are the least reliable ones for trying to determine whether the area is wetland or upland. Um, now, when one of the differences between the 1988 list and all of the other lists that have come since then, or at least the, the 2020 especially, uh, is that the facultative categories are then subdivided further. And so they're given either a plus or a minus, or they're left the way they are. So there's three different flavors of facultative wetland. And we call them fact wet. So there's fact wet plus, there's fact wet, and there's fact wet minus. And fact wet plus means that it's on the wetter end of that spectrum that's considered fact wet. And fact wet minus means you're on the drier end. And fact wet means you're right in the middle. And so the regulations refer to wetland indicator plants as plants that are in the category of FAC, FAC plus, FAC wet minus, FAC wet, FAC wet plus, and obligate. But when the red change goes through, uh, well after I've retired, and most of you probably <laughs> retired, uh, it's just gonna say that if wetland indicator plants are FAC, FAC wet, or obligate. Which is consistent with the way the federal uh, method uh, addresses this. So to give you just some indication of, oh, and one other thing I wanted to say is that um, one of the handouts, and I, I guess we're out of them now, but hopefully you got one. If not, let us know and we'll send you a PDF of it. But um, we, I've taken that list and, and really narrowed it down to uh, a few pages of plants that are more commonly encountered in Massachusetts and are more useful, the more useful plants for delineation. And so you have those, they're broken out by trees, shrubs, ferns, and, and herbaceous. And uh, on the right-hand side, there are two columns, one column for the 1988 list and the other for the 2020 list. And the 2020 column only has an indicator status if it's different from the 88 list, otherwise, if there's nothing on the right-hand side for 2020, it means that it's, it hasn't changed since 88. Scott, so hopefully have. that list will make it uh, easier for you. And, and for me, if I were doing this regularly, I would just laminate it and take it with me in the field wherever I go. We do have it. You, you do have some? Okay. All right, so just to give you some sense of what kind of plants fall into each of these five categories, I've, I've just thrown together some slides of examples. Not a lot of them, so you're not going to become experts on plants, but just to give you a feel for it, some of the common ones. Under the obligate category, so those that are almost always found in wetlands, the only tree, I believe the only tree on the list here for the north, northeast is black willow. Skunk cabbage is an obligate species, and a useful one because it doesn't need a lot of standing water. It just is almost always in wetlands, so it, it can be pretty close to the boundary, and it can be really helpful in that way. This is royal fern. Royal fern is also an obligate plant. Um, here's another fern species. Does anybody recognize this one? Royal fern, yes. And so this is an obligate species. And uh, it's, it's in the same genus as the interrupted fern. And so cinnamon fern used to also be in that genus, just recently got reclassified uh, to something different. But I used to like it because there's these three osmundas that represent the whole series from obligate to fact wet to fact. The cinnamon fern being fact wet and interrupted being fact. Button bush is an obligate shrub almost always found growing with its feet in the water. And tussock sedge. So you're probably familiar with these sedges that create these hummocks. Scott. Yes. Atlantic white cedar is an obligate. Atlantic white is an obligate. Okay, so there are two trees. Thank you. I'm from Western Mass. We don't have that much. Of it. <laughs> it occurs near Springfield, so I shouldn't use that as an excuse. Um, fact, wet species, are usually found in wetlands, and they include the swamp white oak, uh, sensitive fern, spotted jewelweed, also referred to as touch-me-not, winterberry, 
And then when we move on to the fence sitters, the fact species, uh, we have really common species like red maple. So this is probably the most common plant in wetlands in Massachusetts. And it's a fence sitter. So basically, it, that's, if, you, if you're getting my drift here, that's why you need to use soils, because soils give you a more precise feel for what the line is. Because plants are really general, and they can occur uh, in lots of different circumstances. All right, uh, sweet pepper bush is also a fact species. Interrupted fern. And hopefully when we go in the field, I haven't seen the site yet, but at every site we've had so far, we've found interrupted fern and cinnamon fern, which are two ferns that look very similar. And if they're not fruiting, they're really not that easy to tell apart. So this will be a chance to sort of get to, to know how to distinguish those two. Because cinnamon fern is fat wet, and interrupted fern is fat. And then everybody's favorite, poison ivy, is a facultative species. And I can guarantee that you're going to encounter this around the wetland boundary when you're doing delineations or reviewing delineations. Maybe not at every single site, but it's certainly one of the hazards of this kind of work. All right, fat up species, which are most often found in uplands, but occasionally found in wetlands, include white pine, uh, bracken fern, Canada mayflower. For upland species, I only included one because uh, they're not all in the plant list because upland species only occur on the plant list if it's considered to be in another category somewhere else in the, in the country. And so uh, there are uh, a number of examples. Hay scented fern, for example, is upland, uh, and chestnut oak is, is upland. The way that we talk about how lacy they are is how, how they're cut. So the way I like to think of it is that I'm a kindergarten teacher and I've got a classroom of kindergartners. The activity for the day is to create ferns out of construction paper. So just like when you make snowflakes that in wintertime, we're gonna make ferns in the summertime. So you can basically cut out the basic shape of the leaf and hand it to the kids with a pair of scissors and say, go ahead, create a fern. Here's some pictures you can work from. Now, those kids with short attention spans may only cut and create these little these leaflets and then leave it at that. And so this is a leaf. These are leaflets. And if it's only cut once to create leaflets, it's a once cut fern. So Christmas fern, this is a once cut fern. And in here, there's also some sensitive fern, which is often a very good wetland indicator. It's fact wet. And that's also a once cut fern, but it's once cut with wavy edges. So it's a little deceptive. It's like one and a half. Um, this one is a twice cut fern. And so those that are a little more diligent with their cutting, they'll cut a leaflet and then each leaflet is cut again into sub leaflets. So it's cut in two different directions. So it's a twice cut fern. And then the really lacy ones are where you have your overachiever students. <laughs> <laughs> and they're in there diligently cutting away while everybody else is at recess. Um, and so basically you have the leaflet, you have the sub-leaflet, and then each sub-leaflet is cut again into a third you know, sub-sub-leaflet, or, or I'm sure there's a technical term for it that I'm forgetting. And so this is what we call our lacy ferns because thrice cut is about as lacy as it gets, and this one is a, a lady fern. And so lady fern is fac. Uh, is it a cinnamon Christmas fern? fern is fac up. Is the second one you did a cinnamon fern? Cinnamon fern, yes. Mm -hmm. And so this is a fac wet. So let me hand these around and you can see the difference. Which one is the, like what type is the Christmas fern? Is it, it fac it, or? It's uh, fac up. Mm -hmm. Christmas is fac up. Uh, and the cinnamon fern is fac wet. And the lady fern is fac. So you've got three of the middle categories represented right there. All right, so now we have a system whereby we can get a feel for which plants are really solid indicators of wetland hydrology, which ones are wishy-washy, and which ones sort of suggest that a site might be dry. So now 
if we go back to the definition, it says that a wetland is an area within which 50% or more of the vegetative community is made up of wetland indicator plants. So what is a wetland indicator plant? This is how it's defined in the regulations. Any species listed by genus and species in the act, in the statute, is considered a wetland indicator. In addition, there are other, uh, it talks about plants more generally sometimes and just gives a species, a, a, a genus, sorry, like ash. So it'll say ashes and it'll say fraxinus spub. Well, some of them are not wetlands. Some of them are. The green ash and black ash are gen generally found in wetlands, but not white ash. And so we don't include anything that's only listed by genus unless it's sphagnum moss. So most mosses are very difficult to identify, and they're not on the plant list. So generally, we don't use mosses, but sphagnum mosses are wetland mosses that are relatively easy to identify. And then, in addition to whatever is listed in the Act, anything that's on the wetland plant list in the back category or wetter, and again, this is based on the 2020, 2022 handbook. With the 1988 list, it would be uh, FAC or wetter also, but it would exclude FAC minus. And then any individual plants that show adaptation to saturated conditions. And we were at a site uh, for one of the trainings in southeastern Mass, and you know the site had a lot of wetland plants in it, except it also had several white pines in it as well, large white pines that were dominant in the tree canopy. And so white pine is fact up, so they would not be considered wetland indicator plants, except for these white pines, most of them had very shallow root systems that were up above the soil. And so when you see that, when the roots are growing right along the surface, and you're not in stony soils, that's a pretty good indication that they're growing in saturated conditions, and you can include those individual plants as wetland indicator plants. So let's say you have six white pines in this area that you're assessing, four of them have these shallow roots. You can't count all six as wetland indicators. So for me, I would write it down as white pine wet and white pine dry, just to distinguish the ones that do have these adaptations and then treat them as if they're wetland indicator plants as part of the analysis. It's not common, but White pine is one of those species, especially in southeastern mass, that does show up in wetlands more often uh, than it does in other parts of the state. Okay, so sphagnum moss is this really rich, uh, very wet, very moist uh, moss that grows usually in bogs and fens, sometimes forested wetlands. This is the only species that's listed in the Wetlands Protection Act, and therefore is a wetland indicator plant, that is not fat or wet. So eastern hemlock has an indicator status of fact wet, a fact up. And so basically, under the federal method, this would not be considered a wetland plant. But under Massachusetts regulations, it does. And it's not that bad of a situation because I think this hemlock is likely to be the second most abundant tree in wetlands in Massachusetts. So we have wetlands that are dominated by hemlock. And one thing about hemlock is they, they create dense shade, and generally only hemlock can grow underneath hemlock. So you end up with hemlock in all the different strata that you're evaluating. And the other thing is, is that you're not just going to use plants to do uh, delineation. So the fact that hemlock is growing on a hillside, you know, on the northern slope of a, of a mountain, doesn't make it a wetland. You also have to show that it has wetland soils or there are other indicators of wetland hydrology. So the fact that we include a fact up as a wetland indicator plant is not tragic. It it's actually probably makes a lot of sense because you don't want to rule out wetlands that are dominated by hemlock. So it's important to recognize that a lot of wetlands look really different at different times of year. And that vegetation is not quite as reliable it's more reliable than some of the other indicators for hydrology, but it's not as reliable as soils. And so you take an area like this, 
So this is an area that's surrounded by, by red oak and red maple and a little bit of white birch. No real vegetation in the middle, but this is what it looks like in the spring. So it does have hydrology. You just can't see it at certain times of the year. What am I doing? And this is what it looks like in the summer. And so this is just um, completely covered in royal fern, an obligate plant. So it has obligate plants. You just can't see them every, at every season of the year. So it's important that you get used to doing plant ID at different times of the year because delineations can happen at any time of year. And so in the winter time, you don't have a lot of the herbaceous layer and you don't have the leaves to go by. So sometimes you just have to use woody plants and use twig keys in order to key out those species. So this is red maple and this is uh, what the twig looks like. And it's often something that you can get familiar with it up because red maple is so common. Uh, but you can also key it out if you have uh, a, a twig key. Uh, then as spring comes along, these red maple buds open up and suddenly your twig key doesn't work anymore. And you don't have any leaves to look at. So you have to recognize that these are the flowers of red maple. And then you can identify it based on its flowers. Uh, a fern that you might otherwise recognize when it's fully grown may look very different as a fiddlehead, and fiddleheads are a lot harder to identify, and they really aren't, you know, as far as I know, I've never seen a key to fiddleheads, so I don't think we can key them out. You just have to get used to saying, okay, I see this fiddlehead, I'll come back in a couple of weeks and see what it turns into, and then learn your fiddleheads that way. The reason why it's called sensitive fern is because it dies back early in the season, and so that's another really important thing when you're thinking about a delineation, whether you're when you're reviewing one, is you really want to know what date did they go out and do the field work. So some of these, like this is a, a, a rather stunted cinnamon fern, and yet when we go a little farther down, you can see how far they spread out. You know, when I teach these courses to college students, you know, they're getting out in May, so I'm doing early season delineations because that's the only thing I can do. Um, they can see fiddleheads, but they don't see full ferns. So if you're out and you see fiddleheads, you've got to, number one, figure out what species it is. A lot of times with cinnamon fern, you can tell. And then you got to try to estimate how big is it going to get. When you do your percent cover, you want to picture it fully grown out. Skunk cabbage. In the early season, you may only have the red flowers or the little green gnome hats sticking up out of the ground. Those things can get this big around, you know, a nice, vigorous skunk cabbage plant. So in some ways, people have to project ahead in time and try to figure out, once it's fully grown out, how much coverage is there going to be. On the other side, you get late season species that die back early, like sensitive fern, skunk cabbage dies back early, and, and sometimes even before you get a frost, the skunk cabbage is no longer evident. You might find the fruits, and that'll give you a sense that there is skunk cabbage there, but it's really hard to estimate percent cover if somebody's doing the delineation late in the season. And same thing with the sensitive fern. The one advantage you have is, is that in open areas where it grows more vigorously, it also has a single spore-bearing stalk, but it stays erect through the winter. So whereas cinnamon fern sort of warp, you know, drops down, there are some species like sensitive fern where you can see that single stalk and it's pretty distinctive. You can, once you've seen it, you can remember it. And so you'll know that sensitive fern was growing there even though you can't see any leaves or any fiddleheads. The same is true for ostrich fern. And when we came in, we, we saw a patch of ostrich fern. We came by a patch and so we might be able to look at it on the way back. But it's where it grows well, it's very tall. It's like a big feathery plume that's tapered all the way to base, and it has a separate stalk that also persists into the winter and into the next season. But it's a different, very different look to it than sensitive fern. So sometimes you have to look at just the remnants, what, what, to get a sense of what was there, or else you're pretty much stuck looking at woody plants that are around year round. That's cinnamon fern, by the way. 
And then in the summer, things are a little easier because you've got leaves, you've got flowers, you've got seeds, you've got nuts, you've got all kinds of things that you can use uh, to help identify your plants. So, red maple looks like red maple. Cinnamon fern looks like cinnamon fern. All right, so we have our cinnamon fern here, and then we have the lookalike here. Mm -hmm. uh, fairly closely related. Does anybody know what this one is? Interrupted fern? Yes, interrupted fern. Mm -hmm. And these ferns are much easier to identify when they're fruiting. Mm -hmm. And none of them are fruiting in here. So that <laughs> was, makes it complicated, but that's why it makes it useful to learn the other traits that you can use to distinguish them. Now, if this was fruiting, there would be a single stalk coming up out of this rosette that would, early in the season, stand erect. And it would be one of these leaves that's been completely uh, taken over to bear spores. And so it sh sort of shrivels up. It has a very cinnamon color to it when it's early in the season. It then gets darker and then it falls over and, and the stalk becomes limp and it just sort of droops down. So I haven't found, I've seen places where that's... Um, yeah, it looks, I've seen some that look diseased, but I don't see any that are actually fertile. So a cinnamon fern has that single stalk. The one cinnamon fern, is that what the dots on the back side are? Or is that uh, on just... other ferns, yes. Oh, okay. So the, the, the spore bearing, yeah, so the lady fern here, you can turn them over and you see the dots. Those are the sorry or the, the, the spore mm -hmm. producing parts of the plant. But those are now all on one leaf that turns into its own separate stalk for cinnamon fern. And for interrupted fern, rather than being on all of the leaflets, it's just on like three pairs of leaflets. Three or four pairs of leaflets will be completely given over to, to spore bearing. And they'll all shrivel up and be covered with these spore uh, cases. And they turn sort of a dark brown color. And so you see that they're right there in the middle of the leaf. Over time, they'll fall off and create a gap. Mm. And so the fern interrupted. is interrupted. So when they're fruiting, it's easy to tell them apart. <laughs> you know, an interruption or the spore bearing in the mid part of a leaf versus on a separate stalk. But you do get situations like this where you have a lot of the cover in these ferns and the question is, well, what am I looking at? A fact species like this or a fact wet species like that? So here's how you tell them apart when they're non-fruiting. So one is basic shape. Uh, the cinnamon fern is a little bit more acutely pointed. Okay, mm -hmm. This one is a little bit more bluntly pointed. Mm -hmm. uh, cinnamon fern usually is a little bit darker, but in this case they're not that different in color. But it has a leather, leathery texture. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is very supple. Mm -hmm. so this sort of feels plasticky, yeah. and this feels sort of like a soft cloth. Yep. Yeah, right. They both feel gritty for some reason. <laughs> yeah. There's a, you can feel the difference. You did, yeah. yeah, that one's definitely stiffer and that one's not. Mm -hmm. You can actually see it. But the real, the real, the best characteristic is to when you turn them over. Yeah, let's do it this way. For cinnamon fern, there are little fuzzy dots of hair mm -hmm. at the axles where they may meet the stem. Mm -hmm. So I call these hairy armpits <laughs> to help students remember them. Okay. So cinnamon that, fern. I was that I was wrong. <laughs> so I'm glad that that's why I've been telling residents. So I'm glad I'm correct. <laughs> yeah. There you go. If you look at the interrupted fern, they don't have hairy, hairy armpits. <laughs> Like, well, that's that just dirt? Because it looks yeah. like they do have the same color. Yeah, there's a little bit of that fuzz. No, I, they have a little... So you see at the base, the you have stem. this wool here on the stem. Mm -hmm. there, there's usually more commonly found on cinnamon fern, but it also occurs on interrupted fern. But it rubs off really early on in the season. But some of that may adhere along the stem further up. But by and large, there's really not... Uh, there's not that momentum, as it's called. 
So one of the delightful things about botany and learning how to ID things is learning all the different ways that botanists have of describing hairy things. <laughs> so if it's woolly, we call it tomentum. If it's finely hairy, we call it pubescent. You know, if it's more, a little more hairy, then it'd be hirsute. If it's you know, really hairy, it's cespitose. So, uh, and there are others. It's just these are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. And so when you have time to actually work through keys, it's sort of interesting to see. Uh, it's just like all the different ways of describing snow if it's really important to you. All right, so this is FAC and this is FAC wet and that can make it really helpful when you're trying to figure out where the line is because and so you know for me I have a library of field guides that I have accumulated over the years to be able to identify plants at all different times of the year. Uh, now you have apps that you can use to eliminate some of this baggage, uh, but some of these things you might still want in book form. Like this fruit and twig key by Harlow is really excellent for trying to identify woody plants in the winter. I'm going to talk a little bit about plant ID and how to use field guides because there are a couple of guides that I really like and I like them because of the way they're set up. And if you know how to use those guides, you can be really efficient in using them to get to an identification. Uh, one of them is a, a fern key, and so that's why I picked an area like this, because there's a half a dozen ferns in here, and ferns are quite common in wetlands. They're also common around the wetland boundary, and they're also relatively easy to identify, especially with this key, and there are only a handful of species that you have to learn, and you're going to know most of the ferns that you're likely to encounter in and around wetlands. So maybe 10 or 15 ferns and you pretty much got them. Uh, the rest of them you have to go searching for if you ever want to see them. So um, there are some of these that are very, very common in and around the boundary so that we'll focus a little bit on that. Then we'll talk a bit about zonation, how you identify vegetative zones. And what I will tell you is, is that I use the plants mostly to tell me where to dig the holes. And so I don't spend a lot of time doing dominance tests or prevalence index because you can get a pretty good sense just looking at what plants are there and what the indicator status is. And a lot of them are gonna be FAC or FAC up or FAC wet. And, mm -hmm. and so that'll tell you, yes, I'm in the transition zone now, where should I dig? So we'll focus a little bit on that. So let me begin with, with the field guide part. So there's two guides that I'm going to focus on. One is Newcomb's Guide to Wildflowers and the other is Cobb's uh, Guide to Ferns. And, um, you know, when I was a, a sort of eager young man launching into my learning my plants, I you know, bought these field guides and I immediately used the most inefficient method possible to, to learn my plants, which was, okay, I've got my field guide, I've got my plant, now where is it? You know, you're flipping through the book, you're flipping, you're trying to find the right match. You say, I got, well, no, wait, maybe it's this one, maybe it's that one. Uh, eventually somebody pointed out that there is a chapter at the beginning of each book that says how to use this book <laughs> and all the work that they put into organizing it really helps you get to the ID much more efficiently if you know how to use the book. So for the Newcomb's Guide there are three different characteristics of flowering plants that you need to focus on initially and those three characteristics are going to generate a three-digit code which will help you narrow down the portion of the, the key that you need to focus on to get to the ID. So the three characteristics, the first one is the flower type. And there are eight different choices, so they're numbered one through eight. And the first choice is irregular flowers. So these are things like touch me knots, uh, jewelweed, uh, lady slippers that, mm -hmm. that really don't have a, a strong symmetry to them. The other end of the spectrum is plant parts indistinguishable, you know, the flower parts are indistinguishable. So something like goldenrod, mm -hmm. where it's really hard to count the, the petals. And then the others are, have to do with how many regular parts are, are represented in that flower. So it can be two regular parts, three regular parts, four, five, six, and then seven or more regular parts. And once you've narrowed it down to one of those choices, you read across to the, the number and that's going to be the first digit in your three digit code. So if we start with five regular parts, the code is five, 
and so our three-digit code is going to start with five. The second characteristic is plant type. And you have wildflowers, shrubs, and vines as your plant types, and then the wildflowers are divided into four subcategories based on leaves. So if it has no apparent leaves, that's one category or subcategory. Basil leaves only is another. Alternate leaves, and then opposite or world leaves. So you have four options for wildflowers, one for shrubs, and one for vines. So you have six to pick from. So for this example, I'm going to pick alternate leaves, which is a code of three. So now my three-digit code is starting to shape up. I've got five, three, with one more digit to go. And that's going to come based on leaf type, which there are four options. No apparent leaves, leaves entire, which is, you know, uh, it's sort of like this in that there's no tooth, no lobing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have leaves toothed or lobed. And then you have what this really is, is a compound leaf, so leaves divided. Uh, and so those are the four choices. So if we pick toothed or lobed, then the number is three, and our three-digit code is 533. So then, just a few pages further on in the book is the actual key. And if you were to, to, to totally miss what's on the inside front cover and go straight to the key, you're going to have a lot of questions to answer because this is a pretty long key. And it might take you a while to figure out what page you're going to eventually end up on in order to get your identification. So instead, by having gone to the front cover and gotten my three-digit code, I can look at these codes on the left-hand side. So here's 742, here's 632, I'm looking for 533, so I'm going to go back another page, 542, 533. This is all you need to focus on in the key to get to the right page. Mm -hmm. So some of the questions in here is, are the flowers yellow or not yellow? And then are the leaves as wide as they are long or are they longer than they are wide? And so with some simple questions, it will then direct you to a page. When you go to that page, you should be able to find a good match to the, to the plant you're looking at. So that's a really helpful to know how to actually use the book. And so you don't spend a lot of time just searching through pages but you actually can focus your search on where you're most likely to be successful. So feel free to look through that while I talk a little bit about Cobb's Guide. So this fern guide also is set up as a key and it also focuses initially on three characteristics of ferns. And so the first characteristic is height. So some of these ferns are clearly more than two feet tall, so that's one category. Then there's one to two feet, and then one foot or less. So those are the three categories of size that they use. It's the most um, problematic of the three characteristics that you focus on because when something is growing in marginal conditions, it can be stunted. Mm. So you might see something that, where it is over here, is growing you know, three or four feet tall, and you might see it six inches high somewhere else because it's growing in really poor conditions. So if you do use the key and you come up with something that's totally off, you definitely got the wrong page, check a different size class because that's probably the piece that was wrong. The second part has to do with the shape of the leaf relative to the base. So most ferns are shaped like this. There are some really oddball ferns, uh, things like uh, climbing fern, which actually acts like a vine and has leaves that are shaped like hands. So it's a completely different shape. But most ferns are pointy at the tip. A lot of them are broadest right in the middle somewhere, and then they're tapered as you get towards the, the base. And some of them are fully tapered to base, so they come to essentially a point at the base that's similar to the point at the tip. So things like New York fern and ostrich fern are fully tapered to base. So that's one way of describing the shape. This is semi-tapered to base. It doesn't come to a point, but it certainly does taper down. 
And so all the, just pretty much everything in here is tapered to base. It's the most common uh, form of, sh of that shape. The third characteristic has, oh, and, and there are some that are broadest at base. So there's three different categories related to shape and the base. And the third one is broadest at base. And so there are only a handful of species that fit into that category. Uh, bracken fern does. It's more triangular shape, broadest at base. And the broad beech fern is likewise triangular shaped. The third characteristic has to do with how lacy the plant is. And so we have, and I've already picked a number of these, so I'm gonna to try to find one that I've already problem is that I then hand them around and then I don't lose track of where they went. Um, Alright. There you go. That's Christmas fern and then I'm going to just grab one of these lacy ferns. Right here. Alright. There you go. Alright. So, in my experience, the interrupted fern is usually just on the other side of the line, just on the upland side of a wetland line. Mm -hmm. And cinnamon fern is usually on just on the inside of the line. And in, it, they're sort of intermixed in here, but often you can see where it's just cinnamon fern, it starts to get a mix of the two, and then it's all interrupted fern from that point up. Mm -hmm. And that can be really helpful. That's why I focus on, on ferns. Um, and, and the fact that it's if, if you're new to plants and identifying plants, start with ferns because there's only so many species in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and you have a great resource in that guide. Mm -hmm. And you can master your ferns much more quickly than any other taxa group, uh, comparable taxa group. Whatever you do, stay away from sedges or grasses <laughs> or rushes. Yeah. That's for advanced people with a lot of patience. Drive yourself. Mad. Yeah, and a My good scopes. dissecting scope. Yeah. Um, now, when we do assessments of the vegetation, we have to then figure out whether 50% or more of the vegetative community is made up of wetland indicator plants. And so we're going to talk about how that's done. But where you collect, how you collect the data is also important. And one of the changes from the 99, the 95 handbooks to the current handbook is that we are now recommending that you use strip transects rather than circular plots. So circular plots have been recommended at the federal level and they were recommended in, in the 95, 95 manual. The problem with circular plots is, is that you're only sampling a part of the zone that you're trying to evaluate. And so that's okay, scientists do sampling all the time. But if we sample to try to understand something, we use replicates, we use multiple samples. And then we have ways of assessing whether they're too variable to have given us an accurate picture and we need more samples. But the way it's typically used for delineation is people use one plot, a five foot plot for herbs, a 15 foot plot for saplings and shrubs, and a 30-foot plot for trees. What about the specific uh, like plant shifts? Like you, we don't have to ID the plants to recognize that there's a, um, a kind of a line. Herbaceous here, and um, yep. it gets more woodier up there. Yeah. Yep. There's there's more shrubs. Um, up gradient have been here. Well, more shrubs here. There's less of a kind of a more mature canopy right there. Yep. Um, Do you see any differences in the herbaceous layer that's shifting from where David stands to like where I stand and further up? I think a little bit further behind us there's a pretty distinct line of where the ferns stop and we start seeing the pine saplings yeah. come in. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of like witch hazel and we see like high bush blueberry kind of further down here. Um, and it kind of stops, and it's probably doing more like maple leaf by Burnham and Buckthorn over there. So what are, what are the shifts telling us? Um, like if, if before we look at the soils, what do, what do we think potential like lines might be? I mean, it's, it is wet and pumicky yeah. there. Like you can see water. You can't see water standing here, you know? 
So you're talking about zones before. This might be one of the zones here. Mm. Zone one, zone and then two, two and three, and three. going mm -hmm. up, and then four way up by where the pines are established themselves. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. I agree with that. So there's not any pines here. There is, there's one right there, but. Okay. So and then there's a, there's less herbaceous um, you know, material right here where Nancy's standing. Um, it's hard to know what's going on there. This, I can't see. Does the stream kind of go that way? It goes this way. Yeah. Because it, it looks like there's a bend there, but then I can't see if it bends back. Yep. Yeah, it follows. Uh, you kind of, you I don't know, you can't really see from there, but. It's kind of open. The openness is like, it seems like that's a Yeah. So that's kind of the first, first part of this is just figuring out, you know, where the shifts are and if the line is consistently following that. And that way, if you're, if you have a good idea of what the vegetation is on either side of that shift and the soils, and you're asking your applicant to, to show you the soils if you're, if you're questioning it, then you, then you can kind of follow that line all the way around, right? And so if you get a good idea of what's going on in one spot, um, then most of the time you have, you can figure out what's going on everywhere else. Now, sometimes that may work just fine and it may actually be preferable, so we don't rule it out. It's still an option. We just think that it's better to sort of walk through the entire region, the, the whole um, zone, and, and try to characterize the abundance of, of the different species in that entire zone. So the way we use zones is, is that, you know, it's a bordering vegetative wetland, so you know you have a water body somewhere. Work your way then towards the drier portions of the site. If there's an obvious wetland, make note of that. That's a separate zone. When you start to get into the transition zone, keep an eye on the vegetation and also look at topography. And so you're going to then identify different zones based on where the vegetation changes or the topography changes. So in this illustration, we have zone one that's obviously wet and zone four that's obviously dry, and zones two and three are in the transition zone. And so you would do an assessment of the vegetation in zone two, and a separate assessment in zone three, and within that, you're gonna sort of walk along a transect line and keep an eye out for anything that's 50 feet on either side of that line. Which means that you, maybe you're not walking straight, you're sort of doing the drunkard's walk, sort of weaving your way through that zone to try to get a sense of what is the abundance of each of the species that are going to be involved in the assessment? So these are the size plots that I mentioned before, that if you're using the circular plot approach, these are the, the different sizes that you would use. And the, the way that we typically will estimate abundance is using percent cover. And the way that we typically uh, estimate percent cover is using ocular estimation, a fancy term for eyeballing. Okay. And there are other methods. You can do much more rigorous methods to get percent cover. Like you can run out a transect line and have multiple transect lines and every two feet along that line you take a measurement of what, or you tally what plants actually intersect with that. And so these are referred to as uh, either line point methods or line intercept methods. And they can be used, but they're really uh, time consuming. And they're not always necessary. And usually they're reserved only for very, very tricky sites or ones that are definitely going to be going to court. Well, so if they're really controversial and somebody wants to nail it down, they're gonna use a more rigorous approach than ocular estimation. But when you use ocular estimation, you have to recognize that there's a lot of variability. You take three people out and you say, what's the percentage of uh, black gum in this zone? You might get very divergent answers. You might get 16% by one person. You might get you know, 24% from another. And what we do to try to eliminate some of that variability is use cover classes. And so it can be really difficult when you're standing there and you're trying to block out all the other strata. So you're trying to block out the shrubs and saplings when look just at the trees and you're only trying to block out every other species except black gum. And you're trying to get a percent cover. And so sometimes people say, how, how do I, I can't figure out how to do that. I say, okay, well, start this way. Say, is it more or less than 
that might be an easier question to answer. You say, well, I, I'd say it's less than 50% covered. Okay, is it more or less than 25%? And using that series of questions often gets you down to an answer that three different observers are going to get pretty much the same answer. And so by using cover classes and then using the midpoint of each cover class in the assessment calculation, you can basically determine whether 50% or more of the vegetative community is a wetland, indi or wetland indicator plants. When you're estimating percent cover, like, do you do it from where the stem, like the trunk goes into the ground, or what? No, over? It's the leaves. So here, standing here, you'd say that witch hazel would be in your plot, even though it's like rooted no. over there. No. So that's a that's a tricky part. So that's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Is when you're doing percent cover, it's you know. It's, it's easy to describe, it's harder to do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll talk in a minute about the different zones that we might identify for here. And then for each zone, you're going to try to get percent cover for each species in each layer. So that means that you've got to sort of block out, like if you're doing the tree layer, you've got to block out the saplings and the shrubs and look only at the trees. And then you have to look at it one species at a time. You have to imagine that there's a big bright light up there somewhere. And at midday, it's a lot easier to imagine. Uh, but if there's a light directly above your plot or your zone, you will then sort of look at the shadow that's created only by the species you're trying to characterize. And the percentage of the ground that's in shadow due to that one species in that one layer is the percent cover. Mm -hmm. But if it originates outside of your zone, you have to ignore it. So anything that's rooted outside your zone and leaning over doesn't count. You have to try to ignore those and, and only get those that are rooted in the zone that you're evaluating. So to do the assessment, there, there's this hierarchy of steps that you can take. So essentially, the first is a rapid test. And a rapid test is, are all the dominant species obligates and fat whites? Because if they're just all obligates in fact wet, you don't need to do a lot of calculations about that. That's wet. And so you can just go in there and look around and say, yeah, yeah, this is wet, move on. Um, but if it doesn't meet that, that, those criteria, so not all plants are either obligate or fact wet, then you move on to the next layer, next step, which is the dominance test. And so the dominance test I'm going to go through in, in detail in a moment to tell you how a dominance test is done. But again, this is done by the applicant or the applicant's consultant. And conservation commissions don't necessarily have to do a dominance test when you're doing a review. But you should understand what the applicant did and how they came to their conclusion. But it's also something where you don't have to know all your plants. You can just go in and say, OK, I know duh, 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 these are all dominant. They all look wet. What are you talking about when you say this is dry? So the dominance test is then the one that gets used most often. And if, it, if it's determined to be a wetland based on the dominance test, then you can say the vegetation, the wetland vegetation criterion has been met, move on to look at the soils. If it fails the dominance test, and it doesn't conclude that it's wetland, but the soils suggest that they are, then you move on to the prevalence index. The prevalence index is a little more rigorous way of assessing the vegetative community, and it relies on all of the plants that are in the site, not just the dominant plants. So I'm going to go over the dominance test and the prevalence index. Uh, I talked about the rapid test, so we're going to go right to the dominance test. So we're using different vegetative strata or layers, and we're looking for what are the dominant species in each strata. We look at ground cover, because usually when you do the assessment, you assess ground cover first. It's herbs and woody plants that are less than 3.3 feet tall. Uh, so all herbaceous plants, so even Joe Pieweed, when it's up this tall, it's in the herb layer. Uh, it's only woody plants that you put in a different layer if they're over 3.3 feet tall. So those would be shrubs and saplings if they are less than 3 inches diameter at breast height. And they would be trees if the diameter at breast height is greater than 
three inches. And then you have woody vines, or what used to be called climbing woody vines. Woody vines are woody vines. There's really no other category than that. They have to be more than 3.3 feet tall. Now, what you're going to do is try to figure out what are the dominant species in each of these layers as part of the dominance test. But if any of these layers accounts for less than 5% cover in total, all species combined, don't bother with it. So you, you drop any vegetative layer that doesn't reach that 5% threshold with all species combined. All right, so to do a dominance test, for each plant that you assess abundance for. And so abundance is going to be, in this case, for example, percent cover. So A sub I is percent cover, or the abundance of each individual plant. And then we have to divide it by the percent cover for all plants within that stratum. So this is how we calculate percent dominance. So we go from percent cover to percent dominance. And then that, that percent dominance then tells us which species are considered dominant species for the analysis. So what we're going to do is take percent cover for each species and divide by the total percent cover for that stratum. So with an example here, just four shrubs, to keep it simple, you can see their indicator status is there, percent cover is there. We total percent cover for the layer, and it's 80%. So now percent dominance is simply each of those percent covers divided by 80. So 30 divided by 80, 25 divided by 80, 20 divided by 80, et cetera. And so this is percent dominance. Then you have to decide, well, okay, that's percent dominance. So based on that, I'm going to decide which plants are considered dominant plants. How do I do that? Well, first you kick out any layer that doesn't have total percent cover of 5% or more. You then begin with the most abundant species in that layer, and you look at the percent dominance, and you add the next most abundant species, and you keep adding species until percent dominance exceeds, hits or exceeds 50%. And so once you hit that 50%, then you stop adding species, unless the other species, some of the other species that haven't been added yet have the exact same percent dominance as ones that you've already added. So if there are co-equal plants, they have to be put in there too. So if you, if you needed just a little bit more and you had to pull in a 10.5%, which is the midpoint for one cover class, but you actually have three 10.5s, they all come in. Okay. Um, so that's the 50% rule. But after you've done that, you look at the remaining species and decide whether any of them have a percent dominance of 20% or more. And so even if you've already stopped counting from the 50% rule, you continue to add dominant plants if they exceed 20%. And that's percent dominance, not percent cover. So in this example, we start with mountain laurel. And that gives us 37.5%, doesn't break 50%. So we add the, the second most abundant species, which is winterberry, and the two combined do break the 50% threshold. So those two are dominant species. So we would stop with the 50% rule. <coughs> but now we look at the remaining species to see if any of them have a percent dominance of 20% or greater. And Hybush blueberry does. So highbush blueberry is also a dominant plant. So that's how we determine which plants are dominant plants. All right, then of those dominant plants, which ones are wetland indicator plants? So we go back to the definition that we already covered about what constitutes a wetland in indicator plant. Species with an indicator status of fact or wetter, hemlock and sphagnum, and individual plants if they have morphological adaptations to light and saturated conditions. So if we go back to our example, we're going to look to see if 50% of the dominant species are wetland indicator plants, 50% or more. So in this case, mountain laurel is fact up. It's not a wetland indicator. 
Both winterberry and highbush blueberry as fat wet species are both wetland indicator plants. And so if all we had was one stratum <laughs> and four species, this would be considered a wetland plant community because the, more than 50% of the dominant species are wetland indicator species. Okay? All right. Then we're going to go to the prevalence index. And the prevalence index is the more robust sort of an analysis because you use all the plants that you can identify and you have to be able to identify plants to the species level enough to account for 80% of the cover. So if you can't identify most of the plants, you can't use the, the, the prevalence index. And then what this is, is it's a weighted average. So you take the abundance of each species, you multiply it by a weighting factor, and then you add up the weighted values and you add up the unweighted values and you compare it. So the way you weight them is, is that obligate species are multiplied by one, fact wet by two, fact by three, fact up by four, and upland species are fives. So in this example, um, we have five species, and you can see their indicator status, and the E sub I column is the weighting factor. And they're all twos, threes, and fours, because there's no obligates and there's no upland species. So we then take the percent cover, multiply by the weighting factor, and you get, uh, uh, well, percent cover, we use cover classes. So I'm going to use the midpoint of the cover classes, the next to the last column. So it's 38 times three, and then the last column, that product is 1 14th. 2 times 38 it gives you 76. And so you can see that the weighted abundance is in the right-hand column. The cover class is giving us the, the, the sort of total abundance. So if we then uh, add it up, all of the abundance for those six species, it's 100.5. If we add up the weighted abundance, for those six species, it's 283. The prevalence index is simply taking the sum of the last column and dividing it by total abundance. So that would be 283 divided by 100.5. You get 2.82. And the threshold for considering a wetland plant community is three. So if it's lower than three, it's considered a wetland plant community. If it's above three, we say that it's not a wetland plant community. It's more likely an upland plant community. So the last step on this is we're going to use an example um, to, to illustrate the dominance test and the prevalence index. So in this case, we now have four strata. And all of those strata have a total percent cover that's 5% or more. So we're not kicking any of them out. So we take the percent cover, which is the midpoint of the, of the ranges of the cover classes, and we sum them for each layer. We then take the percent cover and divide by the total percent cover for that layer, and that gives us the percent dominance. We then use the 50% rule and the 20% rule, along with the idea of including all co-dominance together to determine which of these species are dominant species. And so in this example, all the ones with the red yeses are dominant plants. So then what we're now going to do is just look at the dominance for all strata combined. So now we're no longer separating them out. We're just looking at what are nine dominant plants. And we want to know how many of those nine dominant plants are wetland indicator plants. So that's in the last column, and it's based on the indicator status. that has to be fact or wetter or hemlock. So here you can see that five out of the nine are wetland indicator plants. And so that means that it's greater than 50%, and this would be considered a wetland plant community. But it's a close call, you know, five out of nine, you know, one going either way. And what's interesting is, is that there are an awful lot of fact up species in this list. So I might look at this list and say, I don't know if I can really trust it. You know, you might say, well, let's do a, 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 a prevalence index just to see what that would give us. So I'm going to use the same data and use it uh, as a prevalence index. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine all plants, not just the dominant plants, by their indicator status, because they're all going to be weighted the same within that indicator status. And it, it doesn't happen in this case, but if any of these plants occur in more than one layer, they get counted twice. And so if, if for instance, it's 10.5 uh, in one layer and 20.5 in another, then you would list it as 31, you know, 10.5 plus 20.5. All right, so for that set of data that we were looking at, you can see that we have no obligates and no upland species. And then when I take all of the species in the fat wet category, it totals 51.5%. Then I multiply it by its weighting factor of two, it gives 103 in the last column. For fat species, there are three species added together, they come to 72.5. Weighted by three is now 217.5 in the last column. And then finally, the fact up species, we have uh, five species, or a total of 69% cover, times four gives us 276. So now we're going to sum total percent cover, and that gives us 193. And we sum weighted percent cover, which gives us total of 596.5, seeing the column totals. So now to compute the prevalence index, we just take 596.5 and divide by 193. That gives us a prevalence index of 3.09, ah, above 3. So the dominance test says it's wet, and the prevalence index says it's not. So this is a situation where you might get ambiguous answers, and this is why we don't always trust the plants because it sometimes it depends on how you assess them. Sometimes it depends on how you estimate percent uh, cover. But also, you don't have to use percent covers. People who work in forestry are very comfortable using basal area for characterizing abundance of trees. And you can use basal area for the dominance test because you can figure out which is dominant using basal area before you combine them all together but you can't combine basal area with percent cover for the prevalence index, that doesn't work. But you could also use something else like, uh, like density, how many stems per meter uh, might be a way that you would look at maybe a, a grass, a wet meadow kind of wetland. Or you might do number of indi individual plants per meter. So there are a lot of different ways to assess abundance. There's a lot of different ways to assess the plant community and people could potentially game the system to try to get the answer they want, but you can always rely on soils to really tell you what the answer is. Well, I can't always. Most of the time, you can rely. All right, so that's going to wrap up the plants. One thing I want to sort of mention before I move on and talk about other indicators of hydrology is that um, you have, as one of the handouts, uh, four different scenarios that I put together so that you can test yourself on doing dominance test and prevalence index. So these are four different sort of made up vegetative communities. And there's also a handout here that takes two pages from the handbook, one with the instructions for the dominance test, the other with the instructions for the prevalence index. So with the instructions, you don't have to memorize everything that I said. You can try your hand at calculating and assessing whether these different vegetative communities are wetland or upland. And then another handout is the answers. So if you want, you can hide these for now until you've done your exercise, but then you can test yourself and see how well you did. As you get closer to the stream, and we start to think about zones, you say, okay, here's the stream. The zone closest to the stream is where I'm expecting it to be wet. And yet, this is a pack up species <laughs> sitting right on the bank. Mm -hmm. And this is lady fern, this is a pack species. Uh, there's poison ivy in here, that's a pack species. Um, so it's not a slam dunk. You also have jewel weed, you know, you've got royal fern as an obligate species. So you've got a mix. And this is what makes it you know, a little frustrating to just use vegetation, because it gives you a mixed signal. And uh, so we have an ash. The question is, is it a green ash or a white ash? Because a green ash is a wetland indicator, a white ash mm -hmm. isn't. And yet, 
you can't really see the parts of the plant that are going to help you identify between the identify two. Identify between the two. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about the dominance test or the prevalence index. I'm looking at the vegetation to try to give me an idea of where to dig. And so here, I see, well, okay, I've got back species, I've got a few you know, back wet obligates. This is a mix, but it, it looks like it could be wet. So um, let me grab my auger and we'll take a look. Or here, I'll use yours. <laughs> when you, like regular, torally speaking, are they still required to do plants? Or if they, just like, like you were saying, just use the plants to figure out where to pull the cores, but didn't document any of it, is that fun? Yeah, so it's going to be a very unusual site where you have hydric soils, but not wetland plants. So. You, your sites need to have wetland plants and hydric soils. But basically, if you have hydric soils, you're almost always going to have wetland plants. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. So you just mean in the wet areas, not in terms of like, you know, you still do, the, like if you were doing it for a client, you'd still fill out a form yeah, for I'd plants, fill out but the just form. closer to the border? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the conservation commission you're going to appear, appear before. So if you come before my commission, I don't care about the forms. I don't require the forms. Forms don't really help me. It's when I go out in the field and I look at the flagging and I say, where are your pits? You know, I'll say, well, why, why is it flagged here? How come you didn't go up and pick up that cinnamon fern over there? Or that little patch of sensitive fern? Or that little patch of high bush blueberry? And a good consultant will say, the reason is I dug a hole there and you can see my flag and it says it's non-hydric and I dug a hole here and it's hydric and this is what I saw that was different and that's why I moved the flag down here. And but, you know, a good consultant will put that on the plot plan. You know, so you've got you know, your site plan, you've got your line, and then you've got all these little spots that show hydric, non-hydric soil pits. Then when I'm out in the field, I can go and ask those questions of the consultant. The consultant has a good answer, I say fine, move on. Sometimes I'll say, really? That surprises me, you know? take my auger and I'll take a look and we'll talk about it and then sometimes they'll say well okay I can move it back and say yeah I'd be more comfortable if you move it back three feet to get an accurate line or most of the time you know I'm convinced you know if the consultant's good they'll have a good explanation but as a commissioner or as an agent it's your job to ask the question you know why why did you put it here why didn't you put it there and so rather than duplicate the whole thing I'm just looking for discrepancies, what look like questionable areas, and a good consultant will already have pits in the vicinity because they saw the same questionable situation that I did. But, you know, there, there are other towns that want to see the forms. They want a full report. They want pictures. They want the whole thing, and that's fine. It's the issuing authorities call. And if, if if, you know, if your commission doesn't have, or if the commission doesn't have access to staff that have a lot of experience, it's better to have full documentation. You know, if the commission has somebody who's comfortable with delineation on the, on the board, then you can sort of dispense with a lot of the paperwork and just sort it out in the field. So that's, that's what we do. So it's a thick, dark A horizon, which probably indicates that it is wet, but at this point I've seen enough to say, okay, I'm gonna move up a little higher. And I want to look, so in terms of zones, what I'm going to do is say from the stream until we start picking up the cinnamon fern, I'm going to call that zone one. And then from right about here, going up, I'm going to call this zone two, where you're picking up mostly cinnamon fern, also sensitive fern, this little bit of royal fern. But as soon as the I start to get stunted cinnamon fern, that's going to be zone three. So you would draw the line sort of right in front of this witch hazel? Right, right about in front of that witch hazel. So it's the same species, but it's different growth form. It's smaller. And it's mixed with other stuff. There's lady fern in there. You got Christmas fern coming in on the edges, um, as well as the, the spinulose wood fern. <coughs> and so my guess is it's probably more uplandy there, but you know it's hard to know just how far up the line goes. But I would then say, okay, well, let's, let's look in here. I'm going to find a place to dig that I haven't already dug. 
pretty dark. All right, let's just look as we go up to the zone three and then we'll wrap it up. But now we're in here where we are at some of the stunted cinnamon fern. Oh, yeah. You see, you got some, some brightness in the subsoil. So, yeah, so up here, even though we've got cinnamon fern, it's a little bit stunted. you got uh, this witch hazel is very vigorously growing right along the edges. So this looks like a good place to put a soil pit to document an upland side of the line. And then down there, closer to that boulder, I would do another soil pit to try to get it try to get an understanding of what's going on with that. And if that does turn out to be wetland, your line's going to be somewhere in between. Then you can use uh, the vegetation and the topography to sort of connect the dots and figure out how to flag a real line in here. So once you get a little farther down, you might do another soil pit, pair of soil mm -hmm. pits just to verify. Continue to use your auger. Sorry, I dirtied oh, it up. that's fine. That's what it's for. <laughs> uh, use that for spot checks to make sure that it doesn't zig around in ways that you didn't expect. But that's how I see the proper use of, of vegetation is. You look at your zones, use that as a way to decide where to dig your holes, probe a little bit with the auger to really select a good place for your soil picks where they'll give you the most information. Then once you've got a pair that's hydric and non-hydric, use your auger again to try to pinpoint where to put the flag. Then you go back to the vegetation to try to figure out how to extend that to create a line. Again, using the auger to make sure that you're not wandering off somehow. And as necessary, additional soil pits just to make sure you've got it covered. Now that's, that's how I would delineate it. You can sort of use that same approach for the review. Mm -hmm. You know, look mm -hmm. at your zones, Look at the area where you think the line might be. If the line isn't there, then ask questions. Why isn't this here? Why is it there? Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully the other things. Notice that in terms of indicators of other indicators of hydrology, they're not really helpful here, are they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got the brook. Uh, but other than that, there really aren't many other indicators of hydrology here that would help you. But in other sites, there could be. So when you find them, pay attention to them, mm -hmm. uh, but just add that to what else you know, you're figuring out from the plants and the soils themselves. All right, this is going to be fairly quick. We're going to talk about other indicators of hydrology, and then you're going to get a break. And after the break, Deb is going to then uh, just completely entrance you with the science of soils. It is pretty interesting stuff. So. The federal uh, approach, when they look at indicators of hydrology, they talk about primary indicators and secondary indicators, and you need you know, one primary or two secondaries. And I've looked at that list, and it doesn't make any sense to me, uh, so I did something different. So basically, I created three different categories of indicators of hydrology based on how reliable they are, how much you can depend on them. And we looked at this in terms of like, well, do we want to do one from column A or two from column B or one from B and one from C? It doesn't make sense. You, what you need to do is just take this evidence and use it along with the soils and vegetation to do the best job you can to determine where the wetland hydrology ends and uplands begin. So we don't have formulas for that, but we do have just some guidance on which of these indicators you can trust the most. So the first category are reliable indicators. So this is reliable indicators of wetland hydrology. And things on this list, if you find them, you're pretty much going to feel comfortable that you're in a wetland. It's not 100%, but it's close. Um, what else are we seeing? It's a change in elevation, a slight change in elevation right here. Yep, water stain leaves. Seeing water stain leaves. Yep. So some examples are water-stained leaves, where the leaves that have been covered in standing water are often duller in color and often compressed because of the weight of water, and you sometimes see silt deposits on the leaves as well that were deposited by the water. There are certain organisms that live sometimes in ephemeral wetlands like vernal pools, 
and their remnants can be found even after the water is gone. So aquatic snails, uh, there are some air-breathing snails that are uh, terrestrial, so you can't count the white-lipped snail. Uh, but you can count these aquatic snails where their shells are there in you know, a basin that looks like it was wet. Uh, fingernail clams, very, very tiny clams. You can see compared to a dime, they're very small. So we're not talking freshwater mussels. Freshwater mussels are often harvested by predators, raccoons, mink. Uh, muskrats sometimes eat them, and then you'll get piles of shells in places that are not wet. So we're not talking muscle shells, we're talking about tiny little fingernail clams that uh, are able to survive when wetlands dry out and refill every year. And then caddisflies are a type of aquatic insect that's aquaticus larvae, but it, it's actually a flying insect as an adult. They look sort of like moths. Uh, they're in the family Trichoptera because their wings fold so that they have a triangular cross-section if you were to slice through their, their body in the midsection. And the larvae, many of the larvae build cases in order to protect themselves when they're in the water. So in the aquatic phase, this is a very common one in vernal pools where it looks sort of like a pine cone, these little bits of, uh, of vegetation that are, that are glued together from silk that they make with their saliva glands. Uh, sometimes it, they're long, tubular ones, so there are other caddisflies that live in vernal pools that are, have stripes on their heads and really long tubes made out of leaves. Some make their cases out of sand. Some make their cases out of tiny little snail shells. So the thing is, is that these cases remain even after the insect metamorphoses and flies away. So whether the, the area dries out and they all die, or whether they all survived and became adults, the evidence is still there for you to see that this was an aquatic habitat and water was there for a substantial amount of time during the growing season. So all three of these are excellent indicators of water. These are the kind of indicators you see when conditions are particularly dry. Iron deposits, so uh, basically where you have water coming up from the surface, like a discharge wetland where groundwater is coming up. Uh, that will tell you why sometimes that water is laden with iron, dissolved iron. But because the iron uh, becomes a solid when exposed to oxygen, when this groundwater reaches the surface, it all then turns into this sort of gelatinous orange goo on the surface of the, of the, the well. So even after the uh, water has gone away, you have this evidence that you have these, uh, this iron, this reduced iron coming to the surface and oxidizing out the surface. Algal mats, again, you know, if you're in a wet area and then you have a drought period where you have maybe three months with very little rain, there may have been algae on the bottom of that wet area, but now that it's dried out, all that's left is a crust. But that crust tells you that it was covered in water. These are uh, oxidized rhizospheres are areas around plant roots that are oxygen that have free oxygen because the roots leak. And so in an otherwise low oxygen environment, they can create what are called pore linings, which is a sort of long, uh, straight line of oxidized iron along the root channels. And where this occurs, when you got up in the upper part of the soil, you have an indication that those were saturated soils. And then there are plant adaptations that you only find when the, air, when the plant is growing in wet conditions. And one of them is the presence of orenchyma, or air cells. So this is a, a burr reed that I sliced open so that you can see the air cells. And so the stems and the leaves, uh, the leaf stems and the shoots of these plants, when they grow in saturated conditions, are spongy. So you can squeeze them and you can feel how spongy they are because of all these air cells. So things like cattails, uh, arrowhead, pickerelweed, burr reeds, these are all plants that tend to show this orenchyma or spongy tissue when they're growing in wet conditions. If you take them and grow them in a greenhouse, you won't see the orenchyma. So it's based on a plant hormones that concentrate because they can't evaporate in the watery environment of those saturated soils. As those, that hormone ethylene becomes more concentrated, it triggers changes in the plant form to, to produce these air cells. And then in the case of some plants like mermaid weed, 
it actually will change the form of the leaves. And so those leaves that grow underwater are finely dissected like this, uh, like you get with milfoil. And so that's an adaptation to the low oxygen environment in the water. But the same plant may have leaves that are above the water, and they grow sort of more normal aerial leaves that you would see on a terrestrial plant. So if you go to a place, and it looks like it was wet at one point, but there's no water there now, but you see polymorphic leaves, I mean, different forms of leaves on the same plant, that can give you uh, an idea that there was water there. And uh, ethylene is also responsible for this adaptation. Second category of indicators that can be reliable if you interpret them properly. And proper interpretation generally means you have to consider the landscape position and the context in terms of where, where you're finding these things and also recent weather. So sometimes you might be lucky enough where there are uh, some kind of gauged water body nearby and there's hydrological records that could indicate what the hydrology is at the site that you're looking at. I wouldn't count on it, but it's possible, so we, we include it. Um, and, and, and the context is, like, how far away are you from the gauge? <laughs> if you're far away from the gauge, it's not very helpful. If it's right there where you need it, then it can be helpful. Uh, water in the test hole. You know, so sometimes you're, like, not sure. You dig a hole, fills up with water. If it's August, you're good. If it's April, I'm not sure you want to trust that. If it's, like, this year, no. Nah. There's water everywhere, so you can dig holes in a lot of places that aren't wetlands and it might fill up with water. But um, usually the water does drain away, but you have to take into account recent weather. So right after we've had a big storm, you don't want to believe uh, what this might be suggesting to you. So in an area above where the water is, you know, maybe it comes up, but it's not all the way into the upper part of the soil. There still will be water higher up due to capillary action. So capillary action draws water up above the water table. And you can grab a handful of soil, and if you can squeeze the water out of it, it's considered saturated. So the squeeze test. Again, you have to take into account what the weather's been recently. Water marks, they can be on bridge abutments, on rocks, on trees. Uh, but normally, it doesn't tell you how regularly the water is at that level. But if you have multiple water marks, then that sort of tells you that, yeah, water's here pretty regularly on a year-to-year -year basis. You don't know quite how high it is on average, but you know there's been water there, and it's not just a one-time thing. When that happens often enough, then certain mosses will affect, it'll affect the growth of mosses on tree trunks. So here you can see moss trim line is where it can't grow any lower because it's flooded at that level regularly. And so this generally, you can see when it's that even, it probably like a beaver pond was there and then framed because you had a, a pretty consistent elevation for a long period of time. You can see uh, moth trim lines, right? Oh, right, yeah. Um, if you're looking up gradient, do you see any moss trim lines up there? Um, well, yeah. like on these ones, but we're still in the, in the, in the lower elevation. Can you say not there? Is it kind of gone? Shallow root systems, I mentioned before. Uh, when a tree falls over like this, this is a white pine in the lower left, the hemlock in the upper right. But the white pine, you can see just how narrow the zone is where those roots are. They just can't go any deeper because of the low oxygen conditions. And so these trees are prone to falling over. And when they're nice enough to fall over in the area you're assessing, then you can see how shallow the roots are. Otherwise, you're just looking for where they're just running along the ground, and, and this is where you're stumbling and bumbling trying to get through the site because it's really uneven with all the roots. The, the, the context that you have to think about is, is there shallow to bedrock conditions? Because you get shallow roots when you have bedrock, and you get shallow roots when you have really stony soils as well. Adventitious roots are roots that grow above the soil in places where you normally wouldn't expect to find roots on a plant. And so they grow above the soil in order to uh, help with gas exchange. So essentially these adventitious roots have a lot of pores that they use for 
oxygen to get in and get down to the roots. Uh, the right-hand side is a willow that I photographed along the Connecticut River where there's a lot of variable water levels. And that really tells you that, yes, this is flooded at some point in the year. In the upper left is a, a, an alder from a beaver pond out in the Berkshires, where every alder had roots at the same elevation. So it used to be a beaver pond, but it's now been drained. The beavers abandoned it, the, the dam burst. And so you have a legacy. You can see where the water level was by all these bearded alders. Here's another example of adventitious roots, but this also shows hypertrophied lenticels, which are the pores on woody plants that are used for gas exchange, and they tend to be overdeveloped when, when the plant is stressed by saturated conditions. The last category are things that tell you there was water there, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how often there's water or how long the water stays. The world, or what time of year. So we're, we're mostly interested in what's going on during the growing season because when you flood soils during the growing season, you produce low oxygen conditions in the soil. Dale will tell you more about that. And so these, these can be evidence that you use in combination with everything else you see at the site, but they're just not entirely reliable on their own. So observing water, it depends whether there was just a thunderstorm depends on whether it's been really wet July. Uh, so you can't always trust just that there's water. Sparsely vegetated concave surface. So this was the example that I showed, which is misleading because it looks like it's not a wetland, but it really is. But not all concave surfaces are wetlands. Drip lines are where uh, you know, debris, uh, you know, woody debris, bread wrappers, and other things are left in a, in a line by moving water. And so they were left there by water, so you know there was water. You just don't know how long. You don't know how often. So you really don't know if it's sufficient to establish wetland hydrology. But it's helpful to know, yes, there's water here, so I am going to trust the plants. Or there's a reason why I can't you know, see the soil because it's all rocky and stony like this. It's hard to evaluate. But scoured areas are another example of where you have the presence of running water that scours out the fines and leaves the larger uh, boulders and cobble behind. Uh, sometimes areas that stay wet most of the time get dried out during an extended dry period, and then you see the soil start to crack as the soils dry out. They contract. But you also see this in farmland quite often. So it's not a reliable indicator. It's just something to consider if you see it. Drainage patterns, you know, a good heavy thunderstorm produces drainage patterns all over the place, in my driveway, for instance. Um, but in other cases, that helps you know. It's like, oh yeah, it does look like water comes up this high. So it gives you some sense of where the water's been. And then lastly, a pit and mound topography. So wetlands are prone to developing pit and mound topography because the shallow rooted trees are prone to falling over. And when a tree falls over, the root ball comes up, and a lot of soil is attached to that root ball. So in the area where that root ball used to be, you have a pit, because a lot of that soil has now been removed as that tipped up. But then when the tree decomposes, the soil that was wrapped up in the roots are going to then form a mound. And so over time, as trees fall and decompose over and over again, you get pit and mound topography where you have uh, you know, low spots and high spots. This doesn't only happen in wetlands, but it's most commonly encountered in wetlands because almost everywhere else has either been pastured or plowed, and all that pit and pound, mound stuff has been wiped out. But old growth forests will also produce pit and mound topography that is still there after hundreds of years, and so you have to be careful and consider context. If you're in a low area with a lot of pit and mound topography, that may be a wetland. All right, that's all that I have. We're going to have a break in a minute. But first, are there any questions before we take our break? Well, congratulations on surviving the first session. Of this. <laughs> I can promise you that the next will be much more interesting and much more exciting. Uh, but we generally go with about a 10-minute break. So for uh, if you could be back in your seats, then Deb will take over from here. <coughs> Thank you.